you know, you don't, you don't think a whole lot about it. Then later that night, you know, you start thinking, you're like, geez, somebody wants to kill me. That's a little odd. Um, and, and, and it's the sheriff. The sheriff wants to kill you. This wasn't exactly how Adam Salfridge had pictured a career in journalism. Adam was born and raised in Whitley County. In 2009, he was a sophomore at the local college, needed a job. The county's daily newspaper, the Times Tribune, had an opening, and soon Adam had his first assignment and dangerous enemies. Why did you feel compelled to buy a gun? You do have a credible threat against your life, and it seemed like a pretty reasonable thing to do. Samantha also purchased a gun at the same time. Samantha Swindler, then 27, was managing editor of the Times Tribune and Adam's boss. We were reporting on people involved in the drug trade and people who are all hopped up on oxys. I don't know what they're going to do. I thought if something happened, I'd go down with a fight. Samantha was exotic by Whitley County standards, born in New Orleans, educated in Boston. She tangled with public officials as editor of a small newspaper in East Texas. She saw familiar signs in Whitley County. There are problems in this community with the good old boy system, corrupt politics, that kind of thing. It seems to me in many ways that this community's strength is also its weakness in some ways. This is a nice, polite place where people have polite conversation. People it, are very proud here, and it's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing in the way that it doesn't allow you to see the things that need change. Whitley County, Kentucky, population 35,000, is tucked in the state's southeast corner on the border with Tennessee. People here take pride in the natural beauty of Cumberland Falls and in historic Sanders Cafe, birthplace of Kentucky Fried Chicken. There is also poverty. The median income is $26,000. Drug addiction is rampant. Throughout the region, red signs identify homes once used as meth labs. And then there is prescription drug abuse. Oxycodone flows in so freely they call this stretch of I-75 the pill pipeline. In 2002, Lawrence Hodge was elected sheriff of Whitley County on the promise he'd clean it up. The sheriff's raid on one meth lab was covered by the local CBS affiliate. When I knocked on the door, the smell was already knocking me down. We're glad to shut it down and put a dent in our drug problem here. But early in his tenure, there were rumors. Talk around the county, the sheriff had gone bad. From about 2004, he just went downhill and was corrupt, involved with drug dealers, uh, taking payoffs, extorting money from defendants. Todd Tremaine, a special agent with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, says the FBI and state police tried building a case against Sheriff Hodge, but couldn't penetrate his inner circle of drug dealers, crooked politicians and police officers. He was very insulated. What do you mean insulated? There was a lot of fear uh, of what Lawrence might do if they cooperated with the federal, federal agents or the state police. He was untouchable? Yes. Editor Samantha Swindler had heard similar stories and suspected Sheriff Hodge might have a weakness, a paper trail. So she checked the department's evidence law. There were months where nothing was checked in. I knew that this wasn't right because we had arrest every day in this area, particularly related to drugs. And when it was related to drugs, you know there's probably a gun. And it wasn't there. But to mount a serious investigation of the sheriff, Samantha needed help. Why would you hire a 20-year-old, his only journalism experience was working on his high school newspaper? Well, you say it like that. Well, that's true. <laughs> well, he was smart, and he knew about the community, and he cared about um, local government. My aunt overdosed, and the first question I had was, I wonder if she got her drugs from somebody that the sheriff was, you know, protecting. Adam went to work, combing through years of case files. He noted arrests where drugs and weapons were seized by the sheriff's department and should have been logged. It was tedious and time-consuming. At that point, I was working up to like 70 hours a week. It was, it was insane and it wasn't healthy, but I was, you know, just driven. I, I, I knew I was on to something and I couldn't stop. What he was on to was a series of felony cases involving guns and drugs in which deals were cut and sentences mysteriously reduced. What's more, the defense attorney in each case was Sheriff Hodge's close friend, Ron Reynolds. One case involved this man, Rick Benson, a retired social worker. In May 2004, Sheriff Hodge and his men raided Benson's house. In addition to drugs, they found 17 guns. Benson had a previous felony conviction on drug and weapons charges, so was forbidden to own firearms. 
you knew that you'd go to prison? Probably for the rest of my life. Were you scared? Were you anxious? Oh, yeah, I was terrified. Because? My world was over. During the raid on the house, Sheriff Hodge found Benson's bank statement. There was $600,000 in his checking account alone. Despite appearances, this self-described meth abuser was a millionaire, heir to a publishing fortune. The night of his arrest, Benson says Sheriff Hodge offered him a deal. If he cooperated, the sheriff would see that Benson was represented by his old friend, attorney Ron Reynolds. I'd heard of Ron. And his reputation was? He could get things fixed. He said, I'll guarantee you, Mr. Mayor, no jail time, but you're going to have to move out of Kentucky. Did you think he was on the up and up? Well, no, if he was on the up and up, he wouldn't have been able to do that. How much was his fee? $150,000. $150,000 is a lot of money. The rest of your life in prison is a lot of time. Rick Benson says he was also forced to pay the sheriff $10,000 in cash and make a donation to the sheriff's department of $25,000. That's enough to make you say, okay, what's going on here? But then whenever you see the actual cashier's check in that file where he donated $25,000 to the sheriff's department as a condition of his plea agreement, that's just, I mean, that's crazy. With information on that case and others, Samantha and Adam pressed Sheriff Hodge for an interview. He reluctantly agreed. He was just all relaxed, leaned back in his chair, um, you know, being that good old boy. So the sheriff thought it was a field trip? Yeah, you know, you got this, this little out-of-towner girl and this 20-year-old college kid. We played along, we played nice for a very long time, let him lie. In the course of that interview, legally recorded without Sheriff Hodge's knowledge, Adam asked him about the gun seized from Rick Benson, but the sheriff's answers didn't match the facts. He claimed the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, had them. I don't even know who Rick Benson is. He was a big case. Oh, well, that's ATF, yeah. How many guns were there? 17. Oh, Rick Benson? Yeah. They would have just said it. I paid. You probably need to have an ATF agent here with me if you want to talk about that. So I need to ask them if they got those guns. We just need to ask them about the whole case. So when the sheriff said he'd given guns to the ATF, you knew it was lying. They never took the guns. They never even opened a case in this uh, situation. And, and once we had that, I mean, he got a heck of a story. I was like, wow, I can't believe he just said that. He just kept lying, lying, lying. And I was, I was giddy. What do you make of that? The two twenty-somethings, right, with uh, pens and notebooks, could do what seasoned law enforcement officers couldn't do. They weren't dangerous to them. I think Lawrence was thinking, "Hey, kids, let me show you how the sheriff's department works." You know, here's here's the jail, and here's here's Barney, and you know everybody from Mayberry. But they caught him off guard because they'd done their research. The reporters then filed what's called an open records request, requiring the sheriff to show where Benson's guns were stored. But six days later, Adam received a startling phone call. The sheriff's department's been bro broken into. And you know, that, that gets you out of bed real fast. That was my, we got you moment. I knew that he had staged it. I knew it. Sheriff Hodge claimed guns, drugs, and other evidence had been stolen. The office was trashed, but the door showed no sign of forced entry just made to look like a burglary so they could explain for why the drugs and guns had been missing and they'd been missing for several years. So what was Sheriff Hodge doing with these guns and drugs? Guns, gave them to political friends, sold them, traded them for uh, oxycodone. He became a drug addict? Yes, he was a very serious drug addict. He had a bad addiction with prescription pain pills. Adam and Samantha's interview with the sheriff and the phony burglary gave law enforcement the break they needed. The man who once thought himself untouchable was now feeling the heat. Days later, an undercover officer recorded Sheriff Hodge threatening to kill Adam. He said, I'm going to effing kill him. And uh, the informant's like, no, you're, you're just mad. And he goes, no, you don't understand. I'm going to kill him. I've already been by his house. I know where he lives. Despite the threat, the Times Tribune continued to publish damaging allegations against the sheriff and a state audit suggested he may have been stealing money from the department. He was just taking money and cashing it and during convenient times like before a three-day weekend or right before his wife's birthday. By May 2010, the people of Whitley County had had enough. They voted Sheriff Hodge out of office. Six months later, he was indicted by a state grand jury. The most powerful lawman in Whitley County led away in handcuffs in his uniform.
But Lawrence Hodge still had influence. Around the same time, two local thugs, friends of the sheriff, drove to Adam's house. The passenger in the vehicle gets out, approaches me without saying a word, puts his hand a little bit into his waistband, and uh, I just quickly pulled my pistol. You had a pistol on you? At that point, I didn't go anywhere without being armed. He saw that it left the holster. I didn't point it at him or anything. And he explained that they were out looking for junk metal on my dead end street and that they would be going now. You pulled a gun. Were you prepared to use it? Well, you never pull a gun unless you're prepared to use it. Following that encounter, federal authorities compelled Adam to leave town under their protection. Already facing state charges, Lawrence Hodge was also being pursued by federal investigators. Central to their case was attorney Ron Reynolds, the sheriff's accomplice in the shakedown of Rick Benson. Reynolds turned on his old friend, implicating the sheriff in the extortion scheme. Lawrence Hodge had no choice but to cop a plea. Prosecutor told him, we can put you in prison for a very, very, very long time. Our case is solid. You will be convicted. You can see that uh, he was defeated. Last May, two years after Samantha and Adam launched their investigation, former Sheriff Lawrence Hodge pleaded guilty to extortion, distributing drugs, and money laundering. He was sentenced to 15 years in federal prison. He declined our request for an interview.